the lecture on comparing two proportions. Uh, I want to begin with an example to give you a sense of what it is we're going to be working on here. Uh, so our initial question is, are men more likely than women to apply the 30-second rule? You know that that's the rule that says that if you drop food somewhere, if you pick it up within 30 seconds, it's okay to eat. So how would you study that? Well, perhaps you take a simple random sample of men and a simple random sample of women, let's say in Connecticut. So suppose we took 85 men and a sample of 97 women. They don't have to be the same size. And suppose we find out that 62 out of those 85 men and 68 of the 97 women have applied the 30-second rule in the last week. So is this evidence, we want to test the claim, that a higher proportion of all men apply that rule than women do? We'll test the 5% level. We're also going to give a 95% confidence interval for the difference in those proportions. So just to give you an overview, we've got variable population parameter, etc. The variable, the thing you ask each individual, is whether they've applied the 30-second rule in the last week. So that's a binary categorical variable. Population is a little subtle because for the first time we have two populations. The population is all men in Connecticut, and the other population is all women in Connecticut. Likewise, the parameter is subtle because now we have two parameters. We have the proportion of all Connecticut men who apply the rule, we'll call that piece of men, and the proportion of all Connecticut women who apply the rule, we'll call that piece of women. Two different proportions because they're two different populations. Likewise, we have two different samples. A sample of 85 men and a sample of 97 women. And it stands to reason we then have two statistics. There's the proportion of men in our sample of 85, who apply the 30-second rule, and there's the proportion of women in that sample of 97 who apply the 30-second rule. So that's all our basic information. What we're going to do is focus on the difference, right? We have two parameters that will focus on the single parameter, which is the difference, piece of men minus piece of women. You can view that as how much higher percentage of men apply the rule than women. But the important thing about that difference is that, of course, the more difference there is between men and women, the bigger that number is. But in particular, the original question was, does a higher, do a higher percentage of men do it than women? And the, uh, that's equivalent to asking, is this difference positive? Right? So greater than zero means more men apply the 30-second rule. Less than zero, negative, means more women do. Uh, so that's how we're going to address that question. Uh, and naturally, for a confidence interval, to estimate that parameter, we need first a point estimate, and your first guess as to what would be the point estimate is the correct one, which is the difference of the sample proportion for men and women. In our sample, that's, you look up above at the 0.729 and 0.701, you see that's 0.0284. So we're going to give a confidence interval for that difference, the proportion of men minus the proportion of women. For the difference of two proportions, we're also going to test claims as to whether that difference is positive, negative, or non-zero. Um, here's the exact formula for the confidence interval. You don't need to know this, because we're going to do both the confidence interval and the hypothesis test uh, by template. But I want to show you, just to give you a feel, it it's, may look intimidating at first, but it's really very similar to what you're used to. It starts, of course, with a point estimate, p1 hat minus p2 hat, plus or minus, the next thing has always been a z-score or a t-score. In this case, it's a z-score, indicating that the distribution of p1 hat minus p2 hat is a normal distribution. And then the last piece is the standard error, and that looks quite complicated, but notice if you look at, it's the sum of two terms inside a square root. If you look at the first term and you ignore the sub-1s, that is exactly what's under the square root in the standard error for one proportion. The same for the second half. So we really just are taking the two standard errors for the two different populations and combining them under the square root. Okay, but that's all we'll need. We won't need to remember that formula because we will use the template to compute it. Uh, for hypothesis testing, remember we need the five steps of hypothesis testing. So. The first step 
is to identify the null and alternate hypothesis. Here it's actually a little easier than our previous procedures because there's only one null hypothesis we'll ever consider. The null hypothesis is that the two proportions are equal. So um, P1 equals P2 or P men equals P women. That's the same as saying the difference equals zero. And a technical aside, you actually can do a hypothesis test where the null hypothesis has the difference being equal to some number other than zero. It works exactly the same way, but it's not really ever useful, so we will not learn it. Um, and then, just as in the previous two tests that you've learned, there are three possible alternate hypotheses. The first proportion can be less than the second, it can be greater than the second, or you can simply be testing whether it's different from the second. The second step is to identify the sampling distribution. The sampling distribution is P1 hat minus P2 hat. Its mean is P1 minus P2. Its standard error is given up at the top of this page. It follows a normal distribution, but none of that will we need to know because that goes into the computation of the p-value, which we'll let the template do for us. That p-value in step four, I won't even write it down, works exactly the same as always. If it's less than the significance level, it is significant evidence for the alternate hypothesis. Step five, though, is a little bit different. It's a little bit different because there are two possible ways you might have sampled, and they're subtly different. So the most straightforward way is you went out and took one sample that had both your populations mixed together. So you went, took a sample of Connecticut people, perhaps, and then wrote down whether they were men and women. And when you were done, you took all the men and put them in one pile and all the women in another. So that's a single sample out of one combined population. Or you could have gone off and done a sample of men and then separately done a sample of women. It sounds kind of like an obscure distinction. The second one would make more sense if you were like comparing populations in two different countries, right? You wouldn't go knocking on doors and asking, do you live in America or China? You do a a sample in America, you do a sample in China separately. And then it's clear you're thinking of two really distinct populations not mixed together. In the first case, if you just took one sample, then our first assumption is that that sample is a simple random sample of that combined population. And our second assumption is that the population is at least 20 times the sample size. Exactly the same as the first two assumptions in both of our previous hypothesis tests and confidence intervals. In the second case, two samples coming from two populations, both of the samples have to be simple random samples of their respective populations, and both populations must be at least 20 times their sample size. So the simple way to say all of this is, however many samples you take, each is a simple random sample from its population, each population is 20 times the sample size at least. That's straightforward. There's one extra wrinkle. In the second case, if you're taking two separate samples, the samples have to be independent of each other in the sense that whoever ends up being picked from one sample can affect who gets picked for the other. That is almost always obviously true. The only time this comes up, the only time where the independence assumption is not met, is if you had, for example, in the men and women case, if for some reason you chose to take a sample of married couples and in each couple put the woman in one sample and the man in the other. So then, of course, if I'm in the men's sample, then we know that my wife has to be in the women's sample. So who's in one sample affects the other. In that situation, that's called a matched pairs study. We'll talk later about what you do with that unusual setup that's occasionally the right thing to do, um, but that mostly doesn't come up. The third assumption is also a bit more complicated. Remember, for one sample proportion, we the third assumption was the rule, the normality assumption was the rule of 15. Various versions of it, in the, for example, in the confidence interval, it was the number of successes and failures had to be at least 15. The rule is essentially the same here, except it's going to be a little more relaxed. It's called the rule of 10 or 5, because we're still going to ask that the, ex the number of successes and failures in each of your samples, so there's four numbers now, two successes and two failures, we're going to ask that each of them be bigger than some number, but now instead of 15, it's only going to be 10, because we have more numbers to check, 
because somehow the total is more important. Each one doesn't have to be quite as big. And to make your life even more complicated, there's one case where it's even smaller. If you're doing hypothesis testing and you're doing the two-tailed alternative, it turns out you can get away with even weaker assumption. All those numbers just have to be at least five. Okay. This somewhat multi-step thing is written down in the template. So if you ever forget, it's right there. <clears throat> okay, I'm going to briefly describe how to use the template, and then we'll, we'll do it in an example. You go, of course, to the templates page where we've gotten, where we got the one sample mean template, but now we have two samples and two populations, so it will be in the second row, and we're dealing with a categorical variable, so it'll be the first column. Um, and it says two sample proportion. It's also called a Z procedure because we use the normal distribution. When you open it up, it has two tabs, calc and use. It opens up in the calc tab. That's where you do all the calculations. It looks a little less sophisticated than the one sample mean procedure because I made it earlier. I've never updated it, so it's not quite as fancy. At the top, there are places to enter your sample size and your number of successes for your two different samples. So four numbers you'll have to enter. It will compute the sample proportion for you. If you ever know n and the sample proportion, you don't have to multiply them out to get the number of successes. You can just enter the sample proportion. We'll do an example in class of that. <clears throat> and now you scroll down a little bit and you'll see the confidence level. You set that. It defaults to 95%, and you read off the confidence interval exactly as you would in the one sample mean. And if you're doing a hypothesis test, you don't have to enter in a test proportion because there isn't one. The null hypothesis is fixed. And instead of a checkbox or a radio button, there's all three alternate hypotheses are listed with their p-values next to them. You just read off the appropriate one. The use tab doesn't do any calculation, it just summarizes how to use it and reminds you of the assumptions. So good to go to if you forget. So let's try that here. So we remember our numbers, 62 out of 85 men and 68 out of 97 women. We're going to compute a 95% confidence interval. So here we go. I am going to go to my the web page, and you're going to have to pardon me if things go a little bit slowly because I just upgraded my computer. So here I am on the Excel templates page. You should join me there and follow along, uh, or watch for a little bit and then do it yourself, whatever works for you. We're dealing with a categorical variable, and we're dealing with two populations. So it's the two sample proportion Z procedure. I'm going to open that up, and I hope that Excel will open it up with alacrity and here it is. You can see it's a little less sophisticated looking. Oh, Seems to be two copies. So uh, N is 85. Ah, I should say here, you can put either uh, population in either order. It all works as long as you keep track, and because keeping track can be tricky, I highly recommend that you, for right off the bat, label your two samples, your two populations, by what they are. You're allowed to adjust that. So our sample size here was 97, and our number of successes was 68, and it automatically computes the sample proportions for you. Uh, down here it computes the combined standard error, which is the formula we got up there. These are things that you may occasionally be asked for in an online homework. Only reason they're there. The confidence level, we wanted 95%, so we don't have to change it, which means we can read off the confidence interval, 2.84 plus or minus 13.12%, which means it ranges the plausible values for that difference, the difference between of the proportion of men minus the proportion of women in the populations is anywhere from minus 10.28 to 15.96. If you would put women first and then men, 
everything would be the same except this number, 2.84, would be negative. So that's totally fine because, of course, it's the negative. The thing you're estimating is the negative of what I'm estimating here. However, since people tend to be irrationally uncomfortable with negative numbers, you will be more comfortable if you follow the convention of putting first the sample that you expect to have the higher proportion. Usually there's an obvious one, uh, and if you put that first, you'll deal with fewer negative numbers. So I will try to follow that convention, and let's return. Uh, I am, yeah. Uh, the, here's how you report it. It should be pretty recognizable as the way we report confidence intervals. The 95% confidence interval for the difference in proportions of Connecticut men and women who apply the 30-second rule is 2.84 plus or minus 13.12%. And notice, as always, that contains the confidence level 95%. The parameter, in this case it's the difference in proportions, the populations, Connecticut men and women, there are two populations, the variable, whether they apply the 30-second rule, and of course the confidence interval is made up of a point estimate and a margin of error. That's how to do a confidence interval. To do a hypothesis test, our null hypothesis is going to be that the proportions are equal, p sub men equals p sub women, our alternate is going to be that p sub men is greater than p sub women. How do we know that? Because that's what the initial question was. Do men do this more than women? If we had asked, is there a difference, we would use p men is not equal to p women. Um, so we're going to test at the 5% significance level. And once again, let me show you that. Scrolling down. Uh, we see three p-values. The first one is the first proportion is greater than the second, the second is the first proportion is less than the second, and the third is that they're different. So those are the three alternate hypotheses, and the p-values are listed, so you just have to choose. We want men more than women, so that's the first one, 0.336. And I'll just point out that if you look at these three numbers, you see that these two add up to one, each is one minus the other, and this one, is twice the smaller of those two. So the same relation that we found in the one sample proportion is true in every case. All right, so that's our p-value. It's greater than the significance level of 0.05, so we conclude this data is not significant evidence at the 5% level that, this is all old hat, the new part is the proportion of Connecticut men who apply the 30-second rule is higher than the proportion of women who do. Notice the sentence includes the conclusion, not significant evidence, the significance level 5%, the parameters, proportion of Connecticut men and proportion of Connecticut women, the populations, the variable, whether they apply this 30-second rule, and the alternate hypothesis, which is that the first is higher than the second or greater than. Okay, let's check the assumptions. In this case, we took separate samples of men and women, the problem suggested. So, it says both are simple random samples. We're no reason to think that they're dependent on each other, so they're independent. We would need there to be at least 1,700 men and 1,940 women in Connecticut. That's met. Um, the rule of 10 or 5 in this case, we're using a one-tailed hypothesis and the confidence interval, so we'll use the rule of 10, and we need the number of successes and failures in each, in each sample. That is, the number of men who did, and the number of men who didn't, the number of women who did, the number of women who didn't. So that's 62. 85 minus 62 is 23 men did not apply the rule, 68 women did, 97 minus 68, 29 did not, they're all bigger than 10. So that assumption is met. All right, let's do another example. This will have a little bit of a different flavor. This will introduce an exciting new aspect of hypothesis testing. This is, by the way, taken from Agresti and Franklin's textbook on statistics. Researchers looked at a simple random sample of teenagers in upstate New York. So you see this time we have one sample, 
They recorded the amount of TV watched, in particular whether they watch more or less than an hour a day, uh, and they waited 17 years to see if when that teenager had grown up, he or she had engaged in any aggressive acts. I assume aggressive act here means something that would, you know, get a police record or something. We're going to test at the 1% significance level for evidence that there's an association between TV watching and later aggressive acts. Here's our data. You can see this is made up like a table. We, when we talked about the relationship between two variables in one of the early lectures, two categorical variables, we talked about making contingency tables. And when we talked in probability about the relationship between two events, we made tables like this. This is, in both cases, we talked about things being variables or events being associated versus independent. So let me remind you, events are associated if the probability of one is different depending on whether the other happens. They're independent otherwise. Um, so in this case, independent would mean that if you're a heavy TV watcher, your chance of having an aggressive act is the same as if you're a light TV watcher. So P sub heavy, chance of uh, the chance of participating in an aggressive act if you're a heavy TV watcher is equal to P light, the chance of your um, doing an aggressive act if you're a light TV watcher. And associated means those probabilities are different. Okay, so we started with a question about associated versus independent, which is not something we've talked about before in hypothesis testing, but that magic trick that we just did by relating associated to two proportions, p heavy and p light, translated into the kind of problem we just did. So we're going to think of, right, so we started with one population, all New York teenagers, and two categorical variables. There was light or heavy TV watching, and there was uh, aggressive act or not. We're asking if they're associated. We translated that. We turned one of those binary categorical variables into splitting up the population. So if we think of those who watch light TV as one population, and those who watch heavy TV more than an hour a day as another, then now we have two populations and one variable. The variable is just whether they commit an aggressive act. Then P heavy and P light are now the parameters. They're the proportion of aggressive acts in each of those populations. <clears throat> and associated, the variables are associated means P heavy is different from P light, and they're independent if P heavy is equal to P light. Those are exactly the things that we're allowed to use as the null and alternate hypotheses in our hypothesis test. So testing the claim that the two variables are associated means testing the alternate hypothesis, P heavy is different from P light, against the null hypothesis, P heavy equals P light. Okay, so here's our data. Um, I am not going to go through the calculation this time, but you should, and you should make sure you get the same answer as me. You're going to have in under the heavy category, be good to put that first. You're going to have 619 sample size and 154 successes. Second category, P light, you'll have 150, yeah, I'm sorry, you'll have uh, 88 as your sample size and 5 as your number of successes and then you will use the two-tailed alternative. We're looking for evidence that they're different. That's the third possibility, and that you should see a p-value of 5.44 times 10 to the negative fifth. That is less than the significance level of 0.01, quite a bit less, so we conclude. This data is significant evidence at the 1% level that there's an association between TV watching and aggression in New York teens. That's what we're looking for evidence for. That's a sort of diff following a different template for writing the answer. I'll, I'll say that explicitly in a moment. Let's check the assumptions. There's only one sample, and we're told it's a simple random sample of the single population, met. Uh, the population would need to be at least 20 times the total sample size, that's 707. So we'd need there to be at least 14,000 New York teenagers 
that seems clear. And the rule of 10 or 5, in this case, we're doing a hypothesis test with the two-tailed alternative. That's the special case where we only need 5. And the five numbers that were in that table, the contingency table to begin with, are the number of successes and failures in each population. So those four, nu four numbers all have to be at least five, and they all are, just barely, right? We only got five in one category. So that assumption is met. So we found significant evidence that the variables are associated. And if you look, you can see the association is positive. Heavy TV watchers are more likely to engage in aggressive acts. Does that mean that TV watching causes people to be aggressive? That is a question that we talked quite a bit about early in the semester. That's the question of whether the association is causal. Does heavy TV watching cause aggression? So let me remind you of some terminology we use to discuss this. We, um, what we talked about explanatory and response variables. So in this case, what are the explanatory and response variables? TV watching is the explanatory, aggressive act is the response. I would have known that even if the question hadn't said anything because the TV watching comes first and the aggressive act comes later. It's the only way it makes sense to think of the causal relationship. But of course, right here, I said, does heavy TV watching cause aggression? Is it an experiment or observational study? It's observational because the study did not set the values of the TV watching. We did not force kids, teenagers, to watch a certain amount of TV based on random assignment. Okay, so try and identify some lurking variables. I'll remind you, a lurking variable needs to be a variable, something that's different for different New York teenagers. It needs to affect how much TV they watch, and it needs to be related to, almost certainly, it will affect how much, whether or not they have an aggressive act. Think about that for a moment, pause this, and then turn it back on. If you haven't thought of any, let me offer you a hint. As I have said before, when your population is people, then the best way to think about a lurking variable is ask, what kind of person would have a certain value of the explanatory variable? What kind of person, kind of teeny, New York teenager, would watch a lot of TV? And then ask yourself, once you've described that person, is a person like that more or less likely to engage in aggressive acts? Pause this again and see if you can come up with any more. Here's what I came up with. These are sort of groups of, of uh, lurking variables. You could say them a little bit differently, but one group is basically the, the behavior and personality of the parents. It's easy to picture that parents who are attentive, engaged, and strict would tend to keep their kids from watching too much TV. They would have kids who would watch less TV. On the other hand, you could certainly argue that attentive, strict, engaged parenting raises children less likely to engage in aggressive acts. So that is a lurking variable. It's a lurking variable which would tend to cause the kind of effect that we're seeing. On the other hand, the behavior and personality of the kids themselves can affect how much TV they watch. Kids who have social, behavioral, emotional problems might be watch TV because they can't deal with social situations. They might watch TV because they're not getting a lot of pleasure out of school or sports activities, or they may watch TV because their parents can't deal with them and sit them in front of a television. So all kinds of social, emotional, behavioral problems could lead to more TV watching, and it's easy to imagine social, emotional, and behavioral problems leading to more aggressive acts. Again, a lurking variable that would cause just the kind of effect that we're seeing. So while we see heavy TV watching is associated with aggression, it's not at all clear that the heavy TV watching is causing it. In fact, there's some pretty easy explanations for that association that have nothing to do with a causal connection. <clears throat> all right, um, in general, this that notion of testing whether two variables are associated or independent is a second way to think about the two-sample proportion test. And in fact, it's going to be the more common way. What's more, going forward, every procedure we learn, we will be able to think of in terms of testing whether variables are related and what sort of relation they have. Um, so any problem I give you can be viewed that way. Some 
will be presented as looking at the relationship between two variables. Some will be presented as relating proportions between two populations. Uh, the only difference it makes in, it doesn't make any difference in the calculation. The only difference it makes is in the best way to report the conclusion. If you're talking about the relationship between two variables, the best way to report the conclusion is this data is or is not significant evidence at the alpha significance level that the explanatory variable and the response variable are associated in the population. Either way of reporting is acceptable. The earlier framework that I gave you is also fine, but the best way to report it is in terms, in the whatever terms the problem gave you. Variables being related or two populations being compared. Um, <clears throat> usually, but it doesn't necessarily have to happen, the a variables associated framework goes along with taking a single sample and the easier check on the uh, assumptions, whereas the two populations tends to go along with separate samples and the harder check. All right, now I want you to try one of this form. I would like to know if gender affects movie preference. So specifically, to do this study, I asked an earlier class of Math 217, um, three sections of it. I asked what their gender was and whether they liked Napoleon Dynamite. Those are my that's my precise form of the question. And here's the results that I got. 27, 20, 13, and 6. You can see it was a very female class that year. Um, it is okay in these if one of the populations is much bigger than the other, or the variables proportions do not come out close to 50%. People often worry about that. It's not a problem. So let's test the claim that gender is associated with whether you like Napoleon Dynamite in college students at the 5% level, and let's give a 95% confidence interval for the difference between men and women college students in the proportion of people who like Napoleon Dynamite and check all three assumptions. So try that and then come back and look. And if you get stuck, I will go through it in stages. So I may get you unstuck and then you should stop and keep going. Um, so what's the sample? It's the 69 students who answered the survey. It's natural to think of this as a single sample. What's the population? All college students, because the problem said. Explanatory variable is gender. It makes sense to think of gender as affecting whether or not you like Napoleon Dynamite rather than the reverse, which would be kind of silly. And the parameters are the proportion of women who like Napoleon Dynamite and the proportion of men who like Napoleon Dynamite. So our null hypothesis is that the proportion of women is equal to the proportion of men, which is the same thing as saying gender and liking Napoleon Dynamite are independent. And our alternate hypothesis is that they're different. Gender and liking are associated. I didn't suggest a direction, I just asked if they're associated. When you do that calculation, let's do that together, you get a p-value of 40.9%. It is not a good idea to reuse the same template, and yet I'm going to. Uh, so we had uh, the total men was, I believe it was 13 and, oops. Sorry. Uh, 13 men and 6, so a total of 19. 19 men, of whom 13 liked it. And we had 47 women, of whom 27 liked it. And the p-value is 0.4089. And our 95% confidence interval is 10.97 plus or minus 25.23. So I'm going to scroll back down to where I was. 
So we found 40.9 as the p-value. That's higher than the significance level. So this data is not significant evidence at the 5% level that there's an association between gender and liking Napoleon Dynamite in college students, or you could report it as significant evidence that there's a difference in the proportion of men and women who like Napoleon Dynamite. Our confidence interval was 11 plus or minus 25.2. We report the 95% confidence interval for the difference in the proportion of men who like Napoleon Dynamite and the proportion of women among college students is that. Check the assumption. Simple random sample, not met. It was a convenient sample. Only Fairfield U students, in fact, only 217 students were included. Large population is fine. Total sample size was 66, one sample. 20 times 66 means we'd need at least 1,320 college students, which is met. We use the rule of five, although I called it the rule of 10 here, um, because it's a two-tailed hypothesis test, and all four numbers are more than five, so we are fine. After watching this lecture, you should know how to find a confidence interval for the difference of proportions using the template, how to express it in a sentence, including the confidence level, populations, variables, parameters, etc. You should know how to choose null and alternate hypotheses for two sample proportions, when the question addresses proportions in two different populations, and when it addresses the relationship between two variables in one population. You should know how to use the template to find the p-value, how to report your results in a sentence, including the conclusion and all the other pieces of information in either of the two languages, and you should know how to check the assumptions depending on whether the data was gathered as one sample or two.